Kate Webster is a young Irish woman who was born in 1849 in a small town in the Kellan Oxford area of Ireland. She was from a poor family and lived a very simple life. However, her family tried to meet her needs as much as possible and they were known for their kindness and respect in the town. But Kate was a troublemaker, and she had a bad reputation in the village due to her hobby or profession that she started at an early age, which was stealing. She regularly robbed a lot of people and sometimes she was caught red-handed. One time, when she was 15 years old, she was arrested for theft and sent to prison for three years. After serving her sentence, she was released from prison at the age of 18. At that time, she seriously decided to change herself and travel abroad in order to work, build her future, and start a better life. Therefore, she went to the nearest house next to her and stole sums of money in order to buy a ticket to travel to England. I mean, she stole so she could stop stealing. In general, when she arrived in Liverpool, she was looking for work, but she ended up stealing again because finding a job was very difficult. Here she was arrested for the second time and sentenced to four years in prison. After her release in January 1872, she traveled to London and worked as a cleaner and maid, but she could not avoid problems. For example, she would go and rent rooms in houses before selling everything of value in the room and fleeing. She also worked as a prostitute to get some money, and one of her promiscuous relationships resulted in a young child who did not know exactly who his father was. Unfortunately, she did not break her old bad habit, but returned to stealing and was arrested for the third time. There she spent 18 months in prison after being convicted of 36 counts of theft. In 1875, shortly after her release, she was convicted of the same crime and was imprisoned for another year in February 1877 for the fourth time. Perhaps you will wonder where the little boy was all that time during her imprisonment. When Kate came to London for the first time, she met a friend there who used to keep her young child with her to take care of him during her frequent absences due to her thefts. It was very clear that stealing was a disease she suffered from, and she justified her action by saying that she was afraid of extreme poverty, so she was stealing for her sake and for the sake of her child. It is worth noting that Kate's crimes were not new to the police at all. During the Victorian era in Britain, there were many people below the poverty line who were suffering greatly from miserable conditions and from not finding work, so they resorted to stealing and committing crimes to survive. In return, as a means of reducing thefts, they subjected the perpetrators to harsh prison sentences, but none of this seemed to affect Kate. When I got out of prison in 1879, I found work for a wealthy elderly widow named Julia Thomas. Here it seemed as if things were finally going in Kate's favor, but that did not last long. Rather, that was the beginning of the problems and endless terror. Mrs. Julia Thomas Ms. Julia was a retired teacher who lived alone in her home in Richmond. A woman once introduced her to Kate, and because she needed someone to help her around the house, she decided to hire her as her maid. It was clear that Ms. Julia did not know about Kate's dark past at all. Later, over the course of the days, Mrs. Julia began to show slightly aggressive behavior towards Kate at home. For example, she would criticize her for the simplest reasons when she was tidying the house and did not appreciate her for her efforts. Sources reported that the lady began to be a little afraid of Kate for some reason that was not mentioned, and after only one month of working for her. She fired her. Kate was very sad and angry after the woman simply got rid of her, and she found herself back in the same suffering she was in. She had no other job or even a shelter to sleep in. So she went back to the lady and begged her to keep her to work for her for only a week until she found a job and a home, and the lady actually agreed to her request. On her last day, Mrs. Julia was about to go to an event in the church, so she asked her to come and help her prepare herself, but Kate refused. Instead, she wanted to go out and drink in the bar, so she went and left the lady alone. She later arrived at the church late because of her, 
and everyone there noticed how great she was. Upset then. On her way back home, she thought she had gotten rid of Kate forever, but the surprise was when she entered her house, Kate was there waiting for her. She got very angry and started yelling at her, then she left her and went up to the second floor to go to her room. Kate then started getting angry and was annoyed by the way the lady was talking to her. So I followed her and they started arguing again, and suddenly Kate pushed her down the stairs. She did not die, but started screaming loudly, and Kate was afraid that one of the neighbors would hear her, so she ran towards her and strangled her forcefully until her soul was exhausted. Kate stood looking at the corpse in front of her and immediately began thinking about how to get rid of it quickly, and then a very diabolical and hideous idea came to her mind. She wanted to completely get rid of any trace of Lady Julia. So she brought a meat saw and started cutting her into several parts, then separated her head from her body. After that, she opened her stomach with a knife and took out her internal organs. And I burned her. As for the rest of her dismembered body, she brought boiling water and put the lady's parts in it to boil them to erase her identity. The parts were boiled for two days and then I put them in a box except the head and feet because the box did not fit them. It is said that due to the intense boiling of the water, the fat began to disintegrate from the parts of Lady Julia's body, so Kate did an extremely disgusting and shameful act, which was that she collected this fat, put it in cans, and sold it to neighbors and children on the street as pig fat that they could use in cooking. It is said that someone actually bought it and used it later. You may be wondering, hasn't anyone noticed the lady's absence from the neighbors over the past two days? Of course, Kate did not ignore this point as she was keen to communicate with the neighbors and make excuses for them to explain the woman's absence. She also used to do the daily housework in front of them in order to remove suspicions from her. Indeed, the neighbors did not suspect anything suspicious at all, but they smelled a strange, foul odor coming from the house. After she got rid of Mrs. Julia, Kate set her eyes on the valuables in the house, and she did not have much patience until she started stealing these items and planning to sell them to earn money, but there was a problem hindering her, which was how she would sell all these items without anyone suspecting her. After deep thinking, she decided to steal Mrs. Julia's identity. She went and put on her elegant clothes and jewelry and began to act as if she was her. She went out and met with different people and sold things to them in cold blood. She did another shameful act, which was that she took the lady's foot, which she did not get rid of, and burned it far from the house. On March 4, 1879, she met a porter man and his son to sell them some items at a tavern. There she began to tell them lies, saying that she had married, had a child, was widowed, and that her aunt had left her a house in Richmond. You mean Mrs. Julia's house? At that time, she was carrying a bag with her, and it looked a little heavy in a strange way. The man asked her about its contents, but she was avoiding answering. Suddenly, she got up from her place and claimed that she was going to meet a friend and would return, but in fact she went to an abandoned stable near the pub and took out the head of Lady Julia, which she had left. She hid it in her bag, burned it there, and then returned to the man as if nothing had happened. Everything seemed perfect at that moment. She killed her mistress, sold her things, and now had the money she had dreamed of. But she had one last thing to do, which was to get rid of the box that contained the remaining body parts, so she went to the man's son and asked him to come to her house and carry the box with her. She went to the River Thames in order to sell some items in it to a friend of hers. Of course, the young man gladly accepted her help and transported him with her, not knowing that he was carrying a corpse in his hands. After he left the place, Kate threw the box into the river. The next day, March 5, Henry Wheatley, the coal porter, was pulling his wagon on his way to the barn's railway bridge. He passed by the river, and here he noticed a wooden box washed up on the banks. At first he thought that the box might contain the proceeds of a robbery, so he lifted it from the water. He opened it and found that it contained what looked like body parts wrapped in brown paper, 
so he rushed to the police station and handed them the box. The remains were examined by a doctor, who found that they consisted of a dismembered body, minus the entrails, and two legs, with one foot missing. The problem is that the police could not even determine the sex of the body, whether it belonged to a man or a woman, and the doctor mistakenly diagnosed the body as a young man with very dark hair. Police investigations continued to try to determine the identity of the body and its killer, but did not find any evidence, and in the end they placed the unidentified remains in the Barnes Cemetery on March 19. The newspapers at the time called the case the Barnes Mystery. There is controversial information, as it is said that medical students at that time used to take the bodies of the dead to conduct anatomical examinations and studies on them, and they took the parts of Lady Julia to do the same thing. Arrest the Killer One day, Kate made an agreement with a man named John Church to sell him Lady Julia's furniture and other goods, which he wanted to use in his bar called The Rising Sun. By the time the carriages arrived to collect the items, Kate had become increasingly suspicious to the neighbors because they had not seen Lady Julia for a while. When the porters arrived at the house, a neighbor named Miss Ives asked them who had given them orders to take the furniture, and they replied that it was Lady Julia. They pointed to Kate. Then Kate realized that her matter had been exposed, so she fled immediately, and at the same time John Church realized that he had been deceived, and the police were quickly called to search the house, and there they discovered blood stains and burnt finger bones in the stove, and fatty remains in a copper pot, which was the pot in which Kate had boiled the lady. And an old letter in which she had written the address of her real home in Ireland. They quickly began searching for her and discovered that she had fled to her country on a steamship with her young son. The British police contacted the Irish police, and here the Irish police chief realized that the woman they were looking for was the same person whose men had arrested her fourteen years ago on charges of theft, so they followed her to a farm. Her uncle was in Killen and they arrested her there on March 29, 1879, and she was taken again to Richmond. The sad thing is that when her uncle learned of the crime in which she was accused, he refused to give shelter to her son, who was not guilty, and the authorities sent the boy to a local correctional facility, until the time came when a place could be found for him in a school. The Trial of Kate Webster Her case sparked a very wide controversy and gained the attention of the press and public opinion to the point that people were flocking to Mrs. Julia's house to see it, and while she was being led to court, a large crowd of people who had come to attend her trial were waiting for her. Over the course of days, the court heard from a number of eyewitnesses to tell the complex story of how Lady Julia came to her death. Kate tried to implicate John Church and the two men she met in the bar, in addition to her son's real father, but they all provided strong excuses and were excluded from any involvement in the murder. Kate she desperately defended her innocence and said that her intense love for her son was the reason that kept her from committing such a terrible crime. However, all the evidence was against her. Strong evidence of her guilt was revealed, including a woman named Maria Durden who reported that Kate had visited her a week before he committed his crime and said that she was about to sell some property in Birmingham, some jewelry, and her aunt's house that she had left behind. This is strong evidence that Kate was planning her crime in advance and did not commit it in a moment of anger and emotion. The judge commented that after 32 years in the profession he had never dealt with such a crime. After a while, Kate pleaded with him that she was pregnant in an attempt to avoid the death penalty, but it was of no use. The problem was that Kate was cold and rigid in court and only cried twice when her young son was mentioned and shortly before she was executed as she collapsed. On July 29, Kate was executed in Wandsworth Prison at nine in the morning. A crowd of people were waiting outside the prison for her death, cheering, and a black flag was raised over the prison walls, indicating that the death sentence had been carried out. In the end, she was buried in an unmarked grave in one of the prison yards. 
An auction of Lady Julia's possessions was later held the next day after Kate's execution, and John Church purchased the furniture for the house along with many other personal effects, including a watch pocket, the knife with which Lady Julia was dismembered, and the copper pot in which her body was boiled. Other visitors contented themselves with taking small pebbles and twigs from the garden as souvenirs. The house itself remained uninhabited for a period of time because no one wanted to live there after the crime, and it was later rumored that a mysterious ghost hovered over the place where Lady Julia was buried. Discovery of the Skull In 1952, the naturalist David Attenborough and his wife Jane bought a house in an old area dating back to the Victorian era. The house was located near a pub called The Hall in the Wall. This pub closed in 2007 and was neglected, but was bought by Attenborough in 2009 for redevelopment. On October 22, 2010, workers carrying out renovations at the back of the pub uncovered a dark circular object that later turned out to be the skull of a woman who had been buried under the foundations that had been standing for a long time. It was immediately speculated that the skull was that of the missing Lady Julia Thomas, and the coroner asked the Richmond police to conduct an investigation into the identity and circumstances of the skull's owner's death. The skull was reported to have fracture marks consistent with Kate's account of Dame Julia being thrown down the stairs, and collagen levels were found to be low, consistent with it having been boiled. In July 2011, the coroner concluded that the skull was indeed Lady Julia's. It is worth noting that it was not possible to perform a DNA test because Lady Julia died childless and her relatives could not be traced. In the end, the skull was buried in an unmarked grave in Richmond Cemetery on August 24, 2011.